Um, I think round about now, uh, most of us would probably like to dig a hole in the middle of the oval somewhere and go and find a cave and take all our children and stay there. Um, I'm a mum of three children. Uh, my 15-year-old is currently hiking Mordor with his father right now, doing rites of passage stuff, uh, just incidentally, but uh, that's what they're doing. Uh, I've got a 13-year-old daughter and I've got an 8-year-old son. So a lot of what I am doing, I'm living. Uh, I work one day a week as a school counsellor and in private practice. And so a lot of what, what I uh, will talk about also uh, is very practical in terms of it's what I face every single week with families and parents. Really what I wanted to do at this stage uh, of this of the whole conference, of the symposium, was uh, to try and bring hope in this message, uh, in this whole whole day. It's very important, I did a, a radio interview at some point in the morning while one of the other speakers was on, because a lot of the statistics are, are coming out, and they called me and said, please, can you talk with us a little bit about what parents can do? And uh, I said, it's very, very important, it's vital, in fact, that we have speakers like like we're speaking this morning, because they are still educators and parents with their heads in the sand that are clueless to what their kids are accessing. And that drives me bananas. But there are, there are many, many parents that are, are coming on board with this and educators and they want to know what can we do? Is there hope for this generation? So I want to, to just read something to you. I want to start with hope for you. Uh, no, I'm going to read this. We were made for these times. Uh, this was written by, uh, just an excerpt by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Um, she's an American poet, post-trauma specialist, and Jungian psychoanalyst. And she's an author of Women Who Run With Wolves. I've just take a, taken a section out. My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradation of what matters most to civilised visionary people. You are right in your assessments. The luster and hubris some have as aspired to while endorsing acts so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless, is breathtaking. Yet I urge you, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your, spend your spirit dry by, by bewailing these difficult times. Especially do not lose hope, most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. In any dark time there is a tendency to veer towards fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on that. There is a tendency, too, to fall into being weakened by dwelling on, on what is outside your reach, by what you cannot yet be. Do not focus there. That is spending the wind without raising the sails. Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor, suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip towards an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumula accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it, is, it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. Please be encouraged. I know some of you, uh, and I'm a psychologist, so this is, this is my role. My role is to encourage people, and I love what positive psychology has brought into my field. I love how positive psychology looks for human flourishing. In the face of disaster and calamity, we used to look at mental illness. But positive psychology looks at mental wellness. What do we have within ourselves? What do our children have? What do our clients have within themselves to over overcome some of the, the terrible things that, have, that they've come across that have happened to them? And so 
well-being is actually something that is also, well, obviously recognised by the World Health Organisation. And health, well-being is uh, defined as, uh, or health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirm, infirm, infirmity. So I actually have, uh, just last year, I uh, am a co-author of a textbook. Uh, part of my working week involves lecturing at uh, UWS, or Western Sydney, as they are now rebranded. Uh, and this actually is in one of my chapters. Uh, you don't have to understand the biopsychosocial model I teach to nurses and policing students, actually. Essentially what the biopsychosocial model is, is that definition. Is that everything about us as humans, as children, as adults, is not just something social or just something psychological or something biological. It's actually all of those intertwined. And my uh, premise, uh, uh, well, basically what, I, what I'm trying to get across to you today is something that is the premise of uh, a book that I'm uh, just at the point of submitting to publishers on this issue of how we address this issue of pornography and sexualization from all these aspects. We cannot just be looking at the social side. We cannot just be looking at the biological effects. We cannot just be looking at the psychological effects. We need to be involved in all those areas of our children's lives. And so I love this. Where's my, where's my New Zealand lady? There you go. Can you, would you mind, I, I, in my South African accent, I don't want to attempt to pronounce it if there's New Zealanders in the room. How do you say that word? Okay, thank you. Uh, that, what I was very excited about was as I was researching the biopsychosocial model, which in fact comes from George Engel, it is now, it was in about the 70s, it is now taught in uh, health psychology uh, to doctors and nurses, but I was very excited to see that this is actually part of the physical education curriculum in New Zealand. It is a Maori concept, so this is not actually just something that is Western white people's idea of health and well-being. This is actually something that we starting to we, we actually see has a history in Asian cultures, in African cultures. Uh, every two years I go to Africa and speak at the um, African Educators Conference. And this is also very much part of an African cultural idea of well-being. And so you can see those aspects, other than the, the one that uh, we tend to leave out in the West, is the spiritual aspect. Uh, Steve Biddulph actually has uh, a different version of this. He has a tower, uh, and he, the spiritual form falls to the top or sits at the top. But essentially, all of these are what make us as human beings. And I'm going to get to get to in a minute why I'm even bothering to talk about this at a uh, Porn Harms Children and Young People Symposium. So there's a problem. We know there's a problem. A lot of us are feeling a little overwhelmed at the problem. We've had amazing, fantastic speakers that... that my, Dr. Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Flood's uh, research on some of his stuff that he presented this morning is phenomenal. I said to him earlier, I said, Michael, you managed to bring this enormous body of research and bring it right down to us in this simplistic, uh, not uh, in a humiliating way, but in a way that we could actually digest it. So I loved what he had to say. And so what I want you to have a look at is... First, in uh, this concept of well-being, all the facets of well-being, we've learned a lot today about how porn damages each of those walls of well-being. So I want you to have a think, uh, talk to somebody next to you quickly and say which aspects you've learned about today, how does uh, exposure to pornography or access to pornography, what have you learned about the effects on mental and emotional well-being, on social well-being, physical well-being and spiritual well-being. Okay, go.
think by uh, by this time in the day, I think we're all very aware of how it's impacting the walls of our children's homes, of their house in their own body, uh, how it's affecting every single aspect of their lives, and how each one is linked, and how affecting one ends up affecting the others, because they're all interlinked. So what can we do? What can we do about this? So what we do then is we take this model and we look at how we deal with children and how we teach children about relationships and about intimacy and about love and about the effects of porn and how we flip it around and we have these conversations with young people in these four aspects. We have to be talking to them in all four walls of their lives. So we're going to look a little bit now. Bear in mind, I've only got 30 minutes, so I, I can't expand like I usually do with parents or uh, um, educators. I usually uh, talk for about an hour and a half. So I'm just, I'm just trying to pick out some of, some of the main ideas, and I'm going to flip through some of uh, the slides as quickly as I can just to give you an overview. But essentially, when I talk to teenagers, teenage boys and teenage girls, they are fascinated by the teenage brain. I sat with my own 15-year-old last week and watched a video with, together on the, on the lounge just on the teenage brain. Just me saying to him, you are so normal. You are so normal, buddy. You, the, the stuff that you're going through, your anxieties about what, what you think people are looking at and who you think you are, every other teenager is going through that. I tell teenagers that if you think you're walking into the room and everyone's looking at you, well, there's actually something called the spotlight effect. Everyone's spotlight is so bright in their own eyes, they can't even notice you because the spotlight about themselves is blinding them. <laughs> and so talking to them about their brain, they, they're fascinated. And talking to them about how pornography affects the brain, how it changes the brain. Uh, some of the things we've learned this morning, young people are sponges. And, and some of those uh, research papers, if we put it down into their language, becomes a protective mechanism for them. They learn about themselves and they're interested. And also talking, uh, uh, I think it was Michael who said earlier this morning about how teenagers like to always hear about other people doing the stuff because it's always somebody else doing it. It doesn't affect them. It's true. And so talking to young people about what are your friends doing? What are, uh, what are your mates doing? That's how I talk to my children about the stuff that's going on around them. Um, just a quick um, plug for a, a, a colleague of mine. She's www.somesecrets.info. She's not here. I've got no shares in anything of hers. I just love her resources for little children. I say to parents, talk to your little children. Liz Walker, if you are in the room, I don't know if you are, what for your book that's come out. Yeah. I, I just think resources where parents can become aware, we tell them at schools, we tell them in your youth centres, that they need to be having conversations from as young as two when your child learns the names of their body parts. And you don't call it a willy or a pee pee, you call it a penis, uh, so that they actually have the, the words to say uh, parents, I, I encourage them to get over their embarrassment. Their embarrassment, uh, they put their own awkwardness onto their children. Children have no idea that their penis is something to be embarrassed about. They're all looking at each other and they're interested. When there's no coercion and it's normal curiosity, it's perfectly healthy. Uh, they want to know what mommy has that's different to daddy. And, and for them, it's not rude. It's just my arm, my leg, my foot. And if you become awkward, then they become awkward and then if they can't even say the right word for their body part, how can they, when they hit 10, 11, 15 yeah. and see pornography, how can they come to us then? I then also say to parents though, just jumping forward, if you have never had the conversations with your 15 year old, it is not too late. It will be awkward, probably for the first 10 times you do it with your team and tell them, I'm awkward and I know you're awkward, but I love you and I, I care about the adult you are going to become. And so I've been to this conference or I've learned about this or the teachers at, my, at, at your school told me this. And, and this is such an important topic. So I'm interested, what are your friends doing? There's the line again. But teaching children about safe body language, safe touch, uh, there's some fantastic resources there that I, I can't go into at the moment, but that's very important from very early. Something else that falls under the biological wall 
is this whole concept of sensory deprivation. Now, uh, Dr. Charles Spence is an experimental psychologist at Oxford University. He's written hundreds of papers. I was astounded how, at how many. I mean, I don't know how he sleeps because he's just put out hundreds of papers, this man, amazing man. Um, but one of the, the streams, not all of his papers are on sensory deprivation, but one of his aspects that he looks at quite a bit is this, what he calls the touch-hungry generation. And so he's got something, uh, I'm going to just read a little bit about from his, uh, his study. Um, so he had this, this study commissioned by the ICI, part of Oxford, and it was called The Secrets of the Senses. And he argues uh, that psychological well-being and good health relies on a balanced, sensual life. There is evidence that, small, uh, that smell and touch are linked more closely to the emotional centres of the brain than vision or hearing, suggest suggesting that their deprivation could have psychologically damaging effects. He believes a generation of children are growing up touch-hungry. People often... Um, now, all of us work in cave-like situations that may be good for, for seeing their computer screens, but are insufficient for maintaining their psychological well-being. These light-hungry people may be at greater risk of seasonal affective disorder, which we often see in some of the northern um, countries, the northern hemisphere, uh, and depression. There is evidence that neglect of the senses, especially in the workplace, affects health um, and well-being. And so this is his ICI report. And so this was his statement. Sensory def deprivation is an ailment of modern society. While our visual senses overdose on information, the emotional senses of touch and smell are neglected. And so this is something we need to implement into our classrooms and encourage in our classrooms, uh, incorporating all the senses. As a practical exercise, I want you to think about a time when you were engaged in a multi-sensory activity. So the majority of life's most pleasurable experiences are, are multi-sensory, whether we like to admit it or not. Once we start to think about it, we realise, hey, I actually used all my five senses in that. So think for a minute about one of your favourite experiences that pops into your mind and tell someone about it and tell them how you, rem what do you remember the most, which sense stood out the most to you, um, and if you remember using all five senses in that experience. Go. <laughs> okay to, to have intimate touch, non-sexual intimate touch between fathers and daughters or grandfathers and grandchildren. That's not to say we are not uh, aware or careful, but I feel like there are so many men and dads and grandfathers that are afraid because they don't want to be seen as the pedophile or the abuser. And as much as we know it's, there is danger, I think our children are so poor for not being touched. Uh, I love that my daughter can, my husband can give my daughter a big squeeze and she's growing into a teenager and I've, I've spoken to girls who sit in my office at 14 and say to me, Colette, I don't understand, my dad used to hug me and cuddle me and tickle me and now he seems distant 
and I know exactly what's going on. The dad doesn't know what to do because she's developing breasts and, and he feels like, is it wrong? And dads just love your daughters and, and cuddle them and let them know that not all touch has to be sexual. A lot of touch is intimate and that is part of teaching them intimacy. Intimacy um, in relationships doesn't have to be violent. They need to learn about soft touch, loving touch, caring touch, and they learn that from their family. And so often I, I will do things with uh, some of the children who are experiencing problematic internet use or problematic internet disorders, as we call them. It's not an official term. Uh, the psychologists will know it's not an official term uh, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual yet. Um, but for a lot of them, I will say to them and to parents, go out and fill your five cups this week. Make sure that your cup of visual is not the only one being filled. Because if we're having children with, or, or adults who are experiencing issues with pornography, we cannot take it away and not replace it with something else positive. We have to be replacing and working with families with what speaks their child's language. What can we do to replace some of the issues, uh, replace the issue of pornography in their lives with relationships and people and caring. And so we know, uh, I don't need to go through the uh, educational ideas because there's some brilliant ones. Liz Walker has some ex excellent ones. The whole media literacy debate is, is so essential in schools. Teaching young people that objects are acted upon. Find them alternative sites, Instagram, pay, um, Instagram, uh, Pages. I'm, I'm just about it. I'm looking like I have no idea about uh, social media. My son will die. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jace. Um, Facebook pages, Twitter handles, give them uh, options that are positive and alternative. Uh, look for healthy alternatives. I, I'm not going to play this, but I love the This Girl Can ad. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's a movement in, in the US. This is uh, in the UK. It's a video that's just magnificent with energy of all shapes and sizes of bodies that are exercising. Um, teach children, you are free to choose, but you are not free from the consequences of your choice. And it's important for children to know that if, if they choose to go down certain angles, they will face some of those consequences. And our young people, can I encourage you, our young people do think about their futures. I have a 15-year-old who can't even imagine what he's going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning. I get that. But they do care about their futures. He talks to me, his friends talk to me, my clients talk to me about what if I don't get a job? That's one of Mission Australia's uh, biggest statistics at the moment. They found young people are afraid of their future job prospects, uh, of education, which tells me they care about the future. So... Um, Social well-being. This is uh, the biggest area that you come in. We are made for relationships. Again, Mission Australia has found that friendships and family relationships ranked as the most highly valued items, especially for get it, gaining knowledge or information above the internet. Go and find that. It's on Mission Australia. You, if you are parents, uh, if, if your young people have friends, it's them that are actually more important. So our young people, do, it's a myth to think our young people just cannot get away from their phones. It's actually the relationship they're craving. Mm -hmm. And if they are empty and if they are lost and there's hurt and sadness, they go to the internet or they go to porn to fill a need. And we need to give them other alternatives. Be the change. So another encouragement for you from Steve Biddulph. The fact that kids are not all succumbing to forced or unhappy sex too young or too drunk or with too many different people didn't happen by chance. A pitched battle is taking place with co um, concerted efforts from educators, parents and groups like Collective Shout against the uncaring and downright exploitative marketers and the tendency of some parents to put their heads in the sand about the flood of pornography and meanness that the internet brings. If the kids are okay, it's because some adults never lost sight of the need to advocate for them, defend them, educate them, and give them the self-belief to choose wisely and well. Our kids need us, and, and they actually are doing okay when we are involved in their lives. So teach them about intimacy. Teach them about respect. Talk to them about those, those kind of options. Teach them to love people and use things. Uh, 
I just want to read you something interesting um, about the issue of consent. It, it's something that I think Melinda's Tank on Reese's has tweeted this before and put it on her Facebook page. And I think it's something that a lot of us were trying to put our finger on what the issue was with just saying to young people, well, as long as there's consent, it's okay. Something was wrong with that. And this is what I found fascinating by a journalist who, who wrote this. He said, if a boy and girl don't really know each other, how could they know what each other really wants? That's a question about intimacy, not just about consent. University, university administrators take it for granted that a certain amount of sex will be casual, that is, devoid of intimate emotional connection. But our rules now re require the sharing of feelings, even in, an, in, even in an encounter that is by definition divorced from them. We simply assume that virtual strangers will be having sex, but we urge them, or even legally enjoin them, to communicate openly and explicitly about it. We should be asking them why they're having sex in the first place. Who wants to have sex and why? And who really benefits from the Friends with Benefits system? When we separate physical intimacy from the emotional kind, we provide a fertile soil for sexual miscommunication and, yes, sexual coercion. For the past several years, we've tried to be casual about sex, but serious about consent, and it's not working. And so my message to young people is, um, is in fact, why is this jammed? Um, if in individual happiness is of ultimate value, when you learn that sex is about me and my pleasure, devoid of connection or relationship, we are only guaranteed two things. You will have been used or you will use someone else. Sorry, that just popped off. And so just finally, neuroscientists in Italy have discovered that social pain activates the same regions as physical pain. It activates the same regions in the brain as physical pain. So our young people that are hurting in relationships that, that have gone wrong, our boys are confused. Our boys are just as confused as our girls. And we've got boys that are hurting because of the script they are told that they should be following. And they're confused and bewildered because it's actually not working and they're left lonely. And so... Uh, what we know about men and boys is that there was this long, longitudinal study. Uh, it was about 75 years long. And essentially, the conclusion was happiness comes from love. If we can feel loved and connected and intimate with someone, that is what gives us happiness. Not the friends with benefits, not the fuck buddies, not the <laughs> people. And, I, and I, uh, forgive me, I have to say it as it is because that is what it is. And that's what young people call it. Um, that is not what gives them the connection. And so finally, on the spiritual side, we need to give young people something to look for that is bigger than themselves, outside of themselves. When it's just about me and my feelings and my wants, which is, which is a lot of what pornography is, leaves them lonely. Encourage the young people at your schools, at your organisations, to reach out to the, the aged care facility in your community, to reach out to the lower grades, to reach out to women's shelters. Reach out and those people no longer become objects. They become people. That's the biggest way to break down barriers. Get our young people to find a spark, something that makes them come alive. Uh, look up on Google. There's a, there's a TED talk on finding your spark. It is one of the most magnificent talks I've heard for a long time. And middle school children get what we mean when we say find your spark. It is vital to help our young people find their spark if we want to replace this world of uh, evil and the atrocity of porn. Thank you very much for listening. I have a Facebook page. Uh,